Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Visiting speaker series. I'm glad you could all join us this afternoon. If you guys all want to squeeze over to your left, I think we'll just use one screen. I know since we're talking about money, we might as well get cozy and get to know one another. Our guest this afternoon is Professor Michael Hadjimikalakis from the University of Washington. He did his PhD at Rochester, so I'm figuring he's probably old friends with some of you folks in the audience, since it seems like every third person I meet here at Microsoft went to Rochester. Uh, he's been a professor at the University of Washington since 1971 in the economics department and has also been a visiting professor both at the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve System in Washington, D.C. and the Central Bank of Japan in Tokyo. He is here today to discuss with us not only where our economy has been, but perhaps more interestingly, where our economy is going and uh, some factors on how we might predict that. I'm so pleased he could come across the lake and join us. Please help me welcome Professor Haji Mikalakis. Thanks. Thanks for the nice words. Uh, by the way, I have uh, with me, I didn't know whether I should be optimistic or pessimistic uh, as to how many of you will be here. Uh, so uh, just before I came, uh, I made 25 copies of the uh, transparency. I mean, the, it's there, and you can have notes. Uh, you can have notes if you want to. I am pleased to have the opportunity to talk with you today about the economy. Uh, I'll focus my remarks on the U.S. economy, as the title suggests. Uh, I'll start by taking a quick look. I'll start by taking, oh, let, me, let me get used to this one. Show me. Could we? Sorry, I, I, I'm trying to use the mouse. For what? So I, I want to hit there, or, or shut up. Oh, interesting. I think hmm. we should probably just use these keys right here. So if you could just use the right arrow. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Then. Oh, okay then. I'll start by taking a quick look uh, uh, back in 2004. Uh, which was a year of strong growth, uh, both for the U.S. economy and the glo global economy. Uh, I'll then talk a little bit about the prospects for 2000, actually quite a lot, about the prospects for 2005, which look promising, um, but I see some uh, risks in the horizon. Uh, the more troublesome risks are in the intermediate to longer run uh, that have to do with the budget deficit and the uh, trade deficit. Uh, since I want to end not on a gloomy note, but on a better note, I want to look at, at the performance of productivity, uh, because productivity is the most important determinant uh, of the standard of living of the United States, or any country. Uh, this is the annual average growth for the U.S. economy, or for real GDP for the U.S. economy. Uh, 2004 has been the strongest year since the uh, recession of 2001. Uh, growth in 2004 was 4.4%, 4 uh, starting from 0 0.5 of 2001. Uh, I caution you, however, that the last quarter, which I just put yesterday on it there, uh, the last quarter shows some weakness. It is 3.1%, uh, and that has a lot, a lot to do with the uh, trade account, the trade deficit that I'm going to talk a little bit about later on. Uh, the consensus forecasts are for growth to slow moderately to about 3.6% this year. 
Inflation is also forecasted to be well behaved, uh, with the CPI rising about 2.5% in 2005, which is more or less the same as 2004. Now, to see what lies behind this forecast and also to identify potential risks, we have to go and check the four uh, components of aggregate spending, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. Uh, let me caution you uh, about one item uh, here, investment. Uh, when economists say about investment, they mean uh, business spending on planning equipment, including software, by the way, uh, uh, business investment on inventories, and household investment on houses, new houses. So, so the consumer is king. 70% of total spending is for consumption. Uh, what is interesting about this slide is that uh, consumption has been strong at a good pace, uh, both uh, in the slowdown and in recovery. In fact, focus in the year of 2001, uh, the year of the recession. By the way, recession started in March of that year and ended in November 2001. Uh, we see that uh, the growth slowed a bit, but it never became negative. Uh, so say, uh, consumption never uh, fell, unlike its brother, investment, we're going to see later on, that did fall during that time. What? Excuse me. Uh, so when you measure consumption, do you measure consumption of just domestic productivity or it, are imports included uh, as well? It's anything that is consumed in the United States. Okay. Anything that is consumed, yes. Uh, so let's see some uh, drug, possible drugs on consumption in 2005. Uh, the first one has to do with monetary and fiscal policy. Uh, beginning uh, in June 2004, the Federal Reserve started raising the short term, the target short term interest rate from the record low 1%, and that is marching upward. Uh, yesterday, they raised it another notch from 2 and a quarter to 2.5%, and, uh, and I predict that before the year is out, uh, is going to rise to at least 3.5%. At least. Uh, I would expect it to even rise a little bit more than that. Uh, of course, the short term, uh, uh, short term interest rates are for uh, short investments and, and short borrowing. Uh, most borrowing has to be for long term. term. Uh, until now, the long term interest rate has not changed, um, but it will change. Uh, so uh, there are the waning effects of the rising interest rate, uh, and especially the long-term rate, which I expect to rise. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, there are going to be waning effect of there are waning effects of fiscal policy. Uh, we had the tax cuts of 2001 and 2003. Now we don't have those tax cuts. Uh, so uh, here is a pleasant mm -hmm. situation. We move away from the drug, and here is the Microsoft effect. Okay. Uh, and we see, uh, we see that uh, uh, personal income uh, has one time a drastic increase there. Uh, as I understand it, probably you know better, um, but of the $32 billion of dividends, uh, about $25 billion of it is for, in, for private individuals. And by that, I mean also pension funds, uh, mutual funds, etc. Uh, from what I see, however, that you guys uh, have not spent that one. It hasn't shown in, uh, in consumption, uh, uh, so you must have saved all of it, uh, or nearly all of it. Uh, anyway, that is the Microsoft effect. Now, another possible drug on the definite drug on, the, on consumption is, of course, rising oil prices. Uh, rising oil prices uh, act like a tax on households. Uh, the more they have to pay for gas and heating oil, the less they have to pay for other stuff. Now, we examine the first, first of the four items that I mentioned. So if consumption growth is slowing, is slowing uh, will any or all investment, government spending, or net exports take its place as an engine of growth? 
uh, let's examine. Uh, on the left axis, uh, we have the rate of growth of consumption. Uh, and, on the, uh, and that is the red uh, line. On the right, uh, we have the rate of growth of business investment. Uh, we see there that uh, the investment boom, uh, by the way, let me say about, uh, uh, I did say about investment that is uh, spending in plant equipment, inventories, uh, and, uh, uh, and, so, and, and inventories. So uh, investment boom of the 90s uh, was followed by the investment bust uh, in the beginning of the millennium. Uh, and the reason, uh, there were several reasons for that. Uh, the first one was uh, falling market, uh, market prices. The second was the dot-com bust. You remember that? Uh, the, the third one, of course, was uh, the horror of 9-11. And the third uh, was uh, corporate governance uh, problems there. So uh, we, uh, we have that one. And so uh, investment fell drastically, as we see. We said earlier, unlike consumption that kept investment has fallen and uh, fell uh, both in 2001 and 2002. Uh, and that happened despite the fact that the same years uh, the Federal Reserve was keep, keep fall, uh, raising the interest rate down. Uh, the approximate reason for that investment uh, uh, Past, of course, uh, where first of all there was excess capacity there, uh, but the second was what Keynes called the father of macroeconomics. Keynes called in 1936 depressed spirits of uh, the depressed animal spirits of the entrepreneurs. Uh, so that is what brought that. But capital spending rose from the dead in 2003. And in fact, it rose by 10% in 2004, 10.3% to be precise. So factors that could accelerate that investment, factors pushing capital spending. Uh, the most important one is uh, uh, this negative financing gap. What do we mean by negative financing gap? It's the difference between capital spending and uh, retained profits may call it cash flow, retain profits. Uh, that is negative which, because of two reasons. Profits are higher, so the robust profits have more retained profits. On the other hand, there is caution detected on the part of firms that do not want to expand. So uh, capital spending, you know, and therefore there is, if they shook off that caution, then uh, there is plenty of funds there are plenty of funds uh, to finance that uh, investment in plant equipment, and that is a major plan. There are internal funds that can do it. They do not have to rely on the interest rates or on banks, and we saw the interest rates rising or in, uh, uh, in, in the bond market to finance uh, that uh, capital. So that uh, is plus. Factors pulling capital spending in 2005 again. Uh, we mentioned the rise in interest rates, but I would uh, also say exactly what I said a few seconds ago, that uh, the importance of rising interest rate uh, may be exaggerated there because they already have the ample liquidity uh, which uh, permits them to weather that uh, rise in interest rate. Uh, the second uh, is uh, the uh, expiration of the 50% bonus depreciation allowance. Uh, this, that was a fi uh, feature of the, the, uh, the 2002 tax cut uh, that uh, uh, was aimed at encouraging immediate, uh, immediate uh, uh, capital spending. Uh, that expired in December to the extent that firms brought forward in 2004 investment that they intended to do in 2005. Obviously, now it's a payback time. We're not going to have that one, so that would be a drag. Uh, the other one uh, is uh, a reduction in the demand of replacement for obsolete equipment. Uh, this could influence uh, high-tech uh, investment spending. Uh, now, the key to a surge in high-tech 
business spending, of course, uh, is the new killer up. When will the next new thing that firms can't live without uh, appear? You must know a lot better than I do. Uh, uh, I'm just a professor. Uh, so there we are. Uh, we finished the second item. We go now to the third, and that is government spending. I do not expect that much from that. Uh, defense spending has been the most rapidly increased uh, component of uh, government spending. Um, but in the last election, uh, the administration pledged that it was going to halve the budget deficit and do that without raising taxes. That is a tall order. Uh, for that to happen, uh, there is going, has to be a drastic reduction in non-defense spending. Uh, I heard some suggestion a little bit last night in the uh, State of the Union address uh, that probably uh, growth in government spending is going to uh, be lowered at least by the inflation rate or something like that. Um, but that is uh, still is not drastic uh, that uh, that requires. Now we come to the last item, and that is uh, the trade cap, actually net exports. Uh, here what we have uh, is a more inclusive measure uh, of the trade gap, uh, uh, and it's called current account. It includes the net investment income between countries. Uh, interest, uh, for example, uh, dividends, uh, like that, things like that, uh, between countries. But it is primarily uh, trade. Uh, uh, we see that, but in percentage terms, it's been increasing since the mid-1950s, and is approaching now, rapidly approaching now, 6% of GDP. Uh, I took this uh, chart, uh, if just if from a, uh, a chart of the Wall Street Journal, if just a few days before the, uh, the election, uh, October 28, 2004. And, and notice the title, post-election problem. I emphasize the problem. Now, uh, to understand the nature of the problem, we have to ask and answer the question, uh, who or what finances that trade gap? Since we have a trade deficit, it means that we import more than we export. Therefore, dollars or net fly out of the country. So there are net capital outflows. Uh, so what would happen? What happens with that? Well. Uh, foreigners get those dollars, they save it, and they lend it back to us. Uh, actually, I can see it in another way. There is another identity which I can use. Uh, and it relates to the question that was asked uh, a little earlier. Uh, the, total invest, the total spending in the domestic spending in the United States uh, is greater than the national output of the United States. In other words, national income. Where do we get that difference? Only by borrowing from abroad. And that is the nature of, uh, uh, net, uh, of the net capital inflows. They just lend money. Now, uh, let's see that one. The left is for the last month, uh, the last uh, 12 months. Um, but I'm interested in the several years. Uh, and you see there the annual. Uh, statistics there, uh, there is a steady march upward, very steep, steady march uh, of, uh, of, of those borrowings from abroad. Uh, you see the numbers, about 700 uh, billion there. Uh, let's see here. And see, now, let's ask the question, why is this a problem? Why is it a, pro is it a problem if the foreign sector, foreigners, are so confident in the United States economy so that they are willing to lend to us to buy, uh, to buy our IOUs uh, or uh, equity or that. Why is it a problem? Uh, normally, it wouldn't be a major problem. But it is not the private sector of foreign countries that lends us the money. It is central banks and uh, these governments. And I'm interested in two countries in particular. It is, uh, the, uh, is China and the Bank of Japan. So the People's Bank of China buys those treasury bonds, 
in Nihon Kingo, the Bank of Japan, buys that. Uh, those countries, uh, of course, no doubt they're nice guys, but uh, uh, they, they do it because they have export-oriented growth. They buy those securities in order to prevent a rise in the yuan for the Chinese or, or uh, the yen for the Japanese. Uh, if the value of their currencies goes up, their goods are less competitive. Of course, the flip side of that, uh, <coughs> if they keep the value of their currencies up, that means that they keep the value of the US dollar high. So that is uh, why they do it. Now, uh, as I said, uh, most of it is from central banks. It's two thirds of the current account was because of that uh, this year. And uh, it was nearly three quarters last year. It was 73 percent, uh, the one in 66, 67 this year. Uh, so uh, we are at the mercy of foreign central banks. Uh, they have become the lender of last resort for the American economy. Now, as it is foolish for us individuals to put all our eggs in one basket, the same thing is for central banks uh, to have the uh, reserves in just one currency. What if they decide to change? So that is the problem here. Uh, and in fact, I have seen uh, a report uh, three or four days ago that quite a few smaller countries, not the larger ones, started diversifying by holding euro as well as dollars. So, uh, and in fact, uh, even China started, they didn't move to euro, but they started uh, using uh, some, I'm going to refer to that in a little while, about uh, repegging the, their currency, and they, uh, they also use some other currencies too. Yes. Okay, so assuming that the People's Bank of Communist Red China decides that they don't want to prop up the dollar anymore, mm -hmm. um, what does that mean in uh, real terms? What it means, uh, well, I'm going to come, by the way. Uh, so I'm going to, I have an answer for you so that, uh, you know, sure, I'm going to come to that. Uh, 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 so I'm going to see the remedies and immediately we'll see what's going to happen there. Okay, uh, we need. So we need, so the United States needs to save more. In other words, to consume, to spend less. Uh, of course, uh, we cannot do it by ourselves. Uh, also, the rest of the world has to do its own part. And that uh, means that they have to save uh, less and spend more. Now, how can they do it? How to, can they spend more? Of course, you know, you spend more if you have more income. Uh, how are they going to have more income? And then the economist gives you exactly what you need. What <laughs> the remedy? You have expansionary monetary policy. They should have expansionary monetary policy, expansionary fiscal policy. That is going to raise their incomes, and that is how it's going to increase uh, their demand for goods, including United States goods. So uh, there we are. Uh, this table is very interesting. Uh, let's look at the second column here. It says <laughs> savings. Uh, the world savings, the world savings is 24.2 percent of GDP. Mind you, this is gross savings. We have not removed the depreciation from that. Uh, let's see, the United States is at bottom, 14 percent. Uh, so what is the net uh, saving for the United States? 1.5 percent. So let's uh, see some other countries. The euro uh, zone in terms of gross saving is 50 percent higher. Uh, Japan, twice as much. Uh, new industrial Asia, and by that I mean Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, and the like, I have there. 31 percent. Uh, developing Asia, which includes China, is 37 percent of GDP. Uh, let's uh, look at the next column there, and I'm going to emphasize an investment. Again, investment uh, 
gross investment in the United States is the large, uh, uh, the lowest. Uh, uh, it is even a little lower than the Eurozone. Uh, however, by the way, uh, that is a little ominous uh, for the economy because the future of an economy and the productive capacity of an economy depends on the capital uh, of uh, the capital in the economy. Uh, not only that, but the new technologies are going to be incorporated only if you have new capital. If you do not have new capital, you don't take advantage of the new technologies uh, and the productivity is going to suffer. So that is another problem. So uh, let's see here, we have the lowest investment, 19.5%, and we still manage to be the only country that has borrowed, has to borrow. We invest so little, and yet we have to borrow quite a lot for it. Uh, and that is 5.5% uh, of GDP borrowing. Uh, and the reason is obvious, is because we have a very small national saving. Therefore, let's zero in on national saving. Yes? Yes. One thing I find that's inhibiting savings is that we've got a limit of $100,000 insurance per account. And uh, my Microsoft annual salary exceeds that, and I've got several years' salary in the bank. And why, why are we taking so long to increase the limit? Uh, well, uh, we probably will, uh, will have the administration. Uh, I'm going to be referring not to a particular thing, but related to that, uh, is that uh, the national savings is the sum of, of two parts, private saving that you are referring to, and the other is saving, you add to that, or subtract to that, uh, what the government does. If it's a surplus, you add that one, and if it's a deficit, that. So uh, what you are saying there, uh, if I understand you right, is that they have to have incentives so that they would increase, uh, 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 so, uh, people uh, would want to save more. Uh, if that is probably what and uh, they can have ways to do that. Uh, but uh, let's come to this one here. We have a savings, national savings. Uh, uh, is the two, these two components, uh, private savings, and of course we add these savings because we have budget deficit. Uh, what is interesting here is that both components are moving in the worst direction, in the wrong direction. Private savings have been following. following. Uh, Budget deficit have been rise. So that's why we have a very low national saving. Uh, in fact, let's see the budget deficit. Uh, in 2000, uh, we had uh, more than 200 billion surplus. And now in 2004, we have more than four, uh, uh, so more than 400. Uh, in fact, uh, in percentage terms, we have moved from a plus 2% of GDP surplus to uh, a 3.5 percent deficit. This is a whopping five and a half percentage point deterioration and that uh, has consequences. We need, it's clear that we need to reduce budget deficit and we have to re, uh, be very methodical about that. We have to reduce it. Um, but uh, if the only thing if we are the only ones who reduce, so, uh, uh, reduce uh, spending, increase uh, saving, uh, then uh, what is going to happen uh, is that we're going to have uh, a, a worldwide slowdown. Why is that so? Because if we consume less of everything, including foreign goods, then their goods, their, their economies are going to suffer and we're going to have a global slowdown. So we cannot do it by ourselves anyway. In fact, others, uh, the other countries have to also do their share. And that means that they have to uh, spend more. And as I said, uh, the way to do it is to uh, stimulate their economy through expansionary monetary policy and expansionary fiscal policy. Another part of the, we said two parts of the solution. There is a third part of the solution, and that is the weakening dollar. Uh, this chart shows there that uh, the brand of the adjustment has been borne primarily, not primarily, but mainly by Euro, the Eurozone. Uh, we see there that there has been uh, a, a depreciation of the dollar by four, nearly 40% by comparison to the Euro. In other words, the Euro increased by nearly 40%. That is what uh, I think the 
European Central Bank said that it's brutal. Uh, that uh, because it made their goods a, a lot less competitive uh, than uh, before, and that uh, they paid the price. Uh, of course, we see here there is the Canadian dollar that has been uh, uh, nearly 30 percent, 25 percent there. Uh, they again, uh, 10 percent. Uh, not shown here. Uh, by the way, you see the yuan. No change. It's back to the dollar. Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, there is. Uh, I, I don't sh show here, but there is. Uh, the dollar has been depreciated by comparison to a broad basket uh, of, uh, uh, of currencies. In fact, it's on a trade weighted basis, and that is the most important one because it encompasses all the trade in there. And that uh, it, de it depreciated by 15%. Uh, that is quite a lot, but unfortunately, if we rely on only weakening dollar, we may need to devalue the dollar by a lot more than that. Uh, maybe at least 15, perhaps even 30 percent more than that. Of course, that would be devastating. And uh, that is what is part of what is called hard landing scenario. Uh, can that happen? Is that a possibility? Uh, well, it can happen if foreigners, including central banks, you remember those two ones and there was a question, if they, uh, if they lose confidence uh, in the US dollar and they through that, then it can happen. Uh, uh, I'll come up about the likelihood of that in a second, but I said if that happens, then there could be uh, drastic changes in both inflation in the United States and interest in the United States. Inflation is very clear. Uh, if the dollar is, is cheaper, then it means that imports are going to cost more. But it's not only that, but American goods also produce goods are going to ex cost more because import competing industries uh, have a license now. They are not afraid of that. They have a license to raise their uh, prices, and that is going to also be even more devastating. There is that. What about the interest rate? Two reasons. The first reason is that. Uh, uh, if foreigners remove their funds, their loans out of this country, if they don't <coughs> let it, if we have less supply of loans, the interest rates are going to go up. On top of that, uh, the Federal Reserve, because it considers itself as the keeper of low inflation, protection of the purchasing, domestic purchasing power of the dollar, uh, in order to protect the dollar from inflation, is going to raise the interest rates on that account too. So on both counts, uh, we should expect a lot of increase in the interest rate. And that is what is the doomsday scenario or hard landing scenario that economists are talking about. Now, uh, how, current, uh, how likely is that to happen? Uh, I think the probability is low, but it's not negligible, and it's not zero. Uh, and uh, I, as long as uh, the other countries uh, want to, uh, to pursue their, uh, their export-oriented uh, programs and all that uh, is unlikely. Also, uh, consider now Japan and China that hold, uh, I don't know, more than a trillion dollar of, uh, of bonds. Uh, are they going to sit there? Is it to their benefit to sit there and see their, the value of those falling and falling, depreciate totally. So uh, they, you know, that is one reason that they may be holding back in doing that. So there, there is that. Uh, so uh, there is that. Uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the longer we wait, uh, the more difficult it becomes. Uh, we shouldn't rely on foreign exchange markets in order to discipline us. The lesson from international financial crisis is that markets can be very harsh teachers. Yes? So two questions. First of all, has this ever happened? And second of all, if inflation results from uh, higher, well, a weaker dollar, huh? then wouldn't higher interest rates discourage domestic investment to offset those higher costs? Uh, yeah, the one is a reaction to the other. Obviously, they are factored in. You know, uh, it would, you know, obviously, uh, when I say rise, that is on net. 
Uh, so that rise is going to have an effect. In fact, uh, it's going to be even bad things. Uh, uh, it's going to reduce the things we care for and, <laughs> and increase the things that we don't care. Uh, so that is, uh, that is a good point. And, and that, and, but uh, I'm factoring in that. It, it is, uh, I th I'm taking that into consideration. Is correct? Yes. So uh, we have that. So uh, as I said, the markets can be harsh teachers. And you can see North both in history of financial crisis and you can see it in modern times. You can see Brazil, you can see the countries, you can see uh, uh, Asia a few years ago, uh, quite a few countries. We had all those problems uh, and uh, so we have to do something about it. <coughs> now, uh, let me less, be less gloomy uh, and, uh, and move now to a more pleasant. Uh, you want me to move to the gloomy one? Ah, uh, so, uh, okay. <laughs> I mean, at some level, export-oriented economies, they can still stay export-oriented economies if they shift focus from, say, the United States to other areas, like Eurozone, right? I mean, so the fact that they're export-oriented, they can still, we can still become less relevant to them. Yeah, uh, well, um, but no doubt, if you are, uh, if you are in Europe, uh, I, I don't often, I, I'm of European origin, I don't visit often, but every time that I visit, uh, I see, I mean, I, I go every three or four years, and three or five years, and, and next time I go, I see a lot more uh, influence of, uh, of those, uh, those export-oriented countries in those countries, you say, uh, in the United Kingdom or in uh, France. Uh, Japan, I believe, is not the biggest trade partner for China. Uh, well, it could be that there are all this, uh, this connection about that. Sure, of course. Uh, there is, of course, the cascading effect. They move from the one to the other and to the other until, you know, there's going to be some kind of stabilization in, in the movements of that. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. Um, in your third point, you mentioned the trade deficit possibly expanding the risk, what would be the effect of a large and ever-increasing budget deficit instead of a trade uh, deficit? Well, uh, actually, that is what I said, uh, the budget deficit, uh, I want me to give you a quick, uh, I could even use some schematics there, but uh, uh, yes, uh, let me be like, the budget deficit, uh, yeah, an increasing budget deficit, or the cost of the budget deficit uh, has to be financed. That means that the government has to issue bonds. The supply of bonds increases. The price of bonds goes down, which amounts to the same thing. They say that people who lend you have to be compensated with higher interest rate. Uh, the higher interest rate, we are talking about the higher United States interest rate. Uh, movement of capital between countries depend on the spread between the U.S. interest rate and the foreign interest rate. If the U.S. interest rate goes up, that spread rises, so it attracts. That is how you attract, they have to be compensated, they attract those. No, when they bring their Deutschmark and the yen and the sterling pounds here, what happens is there is excess supply of foreign currencies, which is the same thing as excess demand for dollars. So excess supply of foreign currency means that the currencies goes down, those currencies, which means that the, uh, the dollar goes up. If the dollar goes up, that is what, then imports increase, and exports fall, and therefore net export. That is exact. That is a call. And in fact, uh, the first person who brought that to the attention was none other. Uh, well, probably I'll call him second, but uh, anyway, uh, his call is the first. Uh, is the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisor of Mr. Reagan, and that was Martin Feldstein. Uh, even in the economic report of the president back in 1983, probably something like that. Uh, maybe 83 or 84, uh, uh, caution the nation about the twin deficits, they call them. The budget deficit begets the current account deficit. And that is the reason. Uh, yes? Yes? So would you recommend interest rate to go faster up? What, what do I recommend? Would you recommend interest rate to go faster high? No, I, I mean, no, they're, uh, they're going to rise. Uh, they're going to rise uh, whether we want it or not, uh, as I said. They're, but uh, that is not uh, the, the way to reduce a budget deficit. The way to reduce budget deficit. I suspect, by the way, uh, I see no way we're going to so, uh, solve these problems without a tax increase. 
I see no way that could do that. Uh, I have a hunch, however, uh, that there is going to be an increase in taxes in the guise of tax reform. Uh, that's going to have some tax component in it. Because I, 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 don't, uh, I don't see any way we can get out of that. Uh, by the way, I can say, some people say, look, and I said before, uh, the long-term rates have not, say, of the 10-year bond has not risen considerably. Do you know why? The one trillion plus le lending from the central banks of China and Japan that I mentioned earlier, not only to the uh, finance our deficit, but they finance our budget. Uh, and uh, of course, without that, then the interest rates are going to go sky high on the second reason. Yes. Well, couldn't you say that we already had a uh, tax increase because now to keep your savings, if you have savings, that is. Uh, at the same level without being hit, uh, killed by the uh, devaluation and inflation, you actually have to make profits. So as you can see, like when the stock market goes up or the, when the currency goes down, the stock market goes up. And that way, to realize that, you have to pay capital gains tax on essentially your uh, flat return. So that's a tax increase. What, uh, it could be a tax increase like that, but it could be a more deliberate. Uh, I would say it could be a, uh, a bit more deliberate than that. Uh, what I, I said, I don't know how they're going to do it, um, but if I had to bet, I will bet that uh, the tax reform would have a tax component that would do it, the one way or the other. Well, maybe that's not enough. I have another question. So then how does this affect the uh, real estate bubble, that if the interest rates go up, what's the raise? So, uh, yeah, that, on is how another, much? that is another danger, a uh, real and present danger. So uh, do you have a like rule of thumb that how much uh, do no, real estate uh, prices I go down? Uh, this is one of the few times that I ventured into uh, forecasting and uh, that. Uh, right. uh, um, but uh, I, I, I know I really do not have a reason, but I, I am scared about that. I am scared about two things uh, recently, as I said. It's uh, the movement of the dollar that never scared me before, and now it does, and that other one that includes the bubble. Right. Yeah, I, I uh, yes. read somewhere, uh, sorry, that there was a 1% point in the real estate prices uh, in interest rates would take the real estate prices down by 10%. Do you think uh, that's I, I could, about right? I, I could, but that, I mean, I, I cannot, that, you know, that is outside my expertise, or uh, I haven't spent that much time analyzing that. But uh, you may be right. Yes. So dollar going down will increase the bubble? And what? The dollar, the weak dollar, uh, yes. will I mean, increase I, the I, bubble, I, right? Of course, that, that is how I understood that. Uh, uh, if uh, indeed, What's going to happen, as I said, uh, is what I said earlier. There is uh, even a remote uh, version of the hard landing scenario, uh, means that it's going to be a substantial rise in the interest rate. And that is going to affect the bubble. It's going to burst uh, quite a lot of the, the real estate bubble. Yes. Yes. You're, you're being very, excuse me, analytic when you talk about higher inflation, higher interest rates. Yep. We have a, a very large and increasing budget deficit, a very large and increasing trade deficit. Our educational system is in collapse, and that's going to affect productivity. In, in human terms, can you talk about what this means? Is this depression? Is this? You know? uh, no, uh, it's not depression. I hope it's not. Uh, uh, it's, it's not depression, but there is, uh, uh, it's not. Is, there is a real danger. It's not present, but it's real. Uh, and uh, if the culprit is the low national savings, and within that is the budget deficit, we identify that. And the prudent thing is to take rid of the problem be when the economy is relatively healthy. If you try to do that when the economy is down, it's going to be one, two. Hit. You fall down and somebody hit you on the head. Uh, that, uh, that is the fear that, uh, that I have that's going to happen. So that is why uh, you know, it's, not, it's real danger, it's not present danger, but in effect it is real and present danger because uh, you do it before you have to because you are going to pay very dearly and in human, in human, in human sacrifices quite a lot.
Uh, uh, we, all of us, I have, uh, I say, parents and relatives who lived through the Depression. You have probably grandparents <laughs> uh, who may tell you uh, about that, and uh, that was a lot of suffering, you know, things like that. I'm not predicting anything like that, um, but what I am saying is that there is a very important danger. That is a very important danger. So, just, just to clarify, you're talking about you know, sort of gradual, steady decrease in, in standard of living, but not huge unemployment and, and, and such as the, the effect. No, of, but uh, I, I, unless it is the hard landing scenario. If it is the hard landing scenario, and there are all those huge things. Yeah, that one. That one. Uh, that, that is going to be important. Yes. Uh, the Treasury Department in December, I think it was, issued the financial report of the U.S. government, and they used gap um, to estimate the state of the uh, government as a financial entity. And if I look at the balance sheet here, they say that the combined total liabilities and net responsibilities as of 2003 was $34 trillion, and that as of 2004, the combined liabilities and responsibilities is $45 trillion. So there's a difference of $11 trillion in the government's total liabilities and net responsibilities. Um, is that something to be concerned about? Well, I mean, I, 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 mean I, I cannot vouch for those numbers, by the way. I mean, I have to go through that. Uh, what I do know is that uh, the national debt is uh, seven, uh, seven and a half trillion dollars. Uh, and, uh, you know, there are you know, <laughs> the issues involved with that. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, there is concern. When I was a young person and I was learning economics, uh, they were always talking about this burden of the debt. Uh, and issues of that sort. Probably uh, uh, that uh, talk subsided uh, because uh, we didn't have that much debt. Uh, and then when we had a lot, then we had uh, three, four years in the 90s when we paid back the debt. And uh, we were uh, so much so that, it, uh, that Mr. Crispin was alarmed, he said, uh, that uh, we were going to run out of debt and uh, people would not have uh, places to park their, uh, their wealth. Yes. No, no question. Okay. Uh, let's see, by the way. Oh, let me go on a pleasant note. So, uh, not doom and gloom. Productivity. Productivity growth uh, is both a tailwind and a headwind. Uh, why is it uh, a tailwind? Why is it an accelerating factor to the economy? Uh, the productive capacity of the economy it relates to something also you asked uh, earlier. The productive capacity uh, of a country depends on two numbers. The rate of growth of labor and the rate of growth of the ability of that labor. <laughs> In other words, uh, productivity of labor. So the sum of those two numbers. So the higher the level, uh, the higher the productivity uh, uh, level, of course, the more you can have of everything. Uh, you can have more output, you can have lower inflation, and you can have higher incomes, higher real wages. Uh, so that is manna from heaven. Uh, so you have that one. Uh, so that is, uh, that is, I said, the maximum sustainable uh, uh, economic growth. Uh, also is called occasionally uh, inflation-safe economic uh, growth. Uh, now, uh, until 19... 95. From 75 to 1995, let me see, do I have here? Oh, uh, well, I'll go to the beginning. Uh, in between the 70s and 90s, uh, labor productivity was 1.5%. Now, 1.5%, you add it to 1%, which is the growth of labor, population growth, and that is 2.5%. Any attempt that they made to increase output to that, Accelerated inflation started occurring. So they could not do much about it. However, in the 90s, uh, we had 2.2 and 3 quarters, nearly 3%. That makes the sustained inflation safe economic growth 4%. And that is what I said. During those years, those nine, in the 90s, we had more of everything. Uh, and, and that, now, uh, let's come to the last three years. The average is very good. Uh, is respectable. Is four percent very good? In fact, four percent even higher than that. Uh, although I notice uh, today's announcement, there was a fall. 
there, there was a fall in that. Uh, but uh, still, uh, you know, uh, it, it is it is uh, it is rather good. Uh, in, uh, there has been a debate the last five, six, seven years uh, about productivity. Uh, we saw higher level of productivity than before. Uh, is it a temporary one or is it a permanent one? Uh, well, no doubt some of it is temporary uh, because uh, it takes some time for firms to be convinced to hire people if there is increasing productivity. They squeeze more labor out of existing ones and they don't have to, uh, to hire permanently. Uh, so, so no doubt some of it. But uh, also now, no doubt, because of you guys are here, uh, they know better ways of uh, managing their companies, managing their productive uh, abilities, uh, 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 have all, all those, those kinds of things, and the, uh, therefore the productivity, both labor productivity and total factor productivity uh, have increased uh, because of that. So there, there is that. Uh, so uh, by the way, I started by saying about uh, economists. There were two uh, groups of economists. The one, the, uh, the pessimists, they said that this, this is temporary. It's going to disappear. Uh, they are the optimists. I was one of them, and I still am. Uh, I have not been convinced that otherwise. Uh, productivity optimists uh, that we believe that we are for a much bigger trend. We, what we're observing is a trend. It's not just cyclical uh, factors that we have. Uh, ultimately, uh, productivity optimism uh, is about uh, future technological progress and the gains we can reap from it. And productivity uh, growth, in fact, the ability of a country to live well depends on its productivity. And that productivity depends quite a lot on what you guys are doing here, uh, here at Microsoft. And on that note, I'll stop and I can answer all other questions. Can you talk about, a bit more about the tax increase you were talking about? Because I don't think it's a legal way of doing it. I think it's taxes in the next, let's so, say, four or five years. So, so that is true, of course. It's easier to uh, promise and deliver tax cuts for a politician than that. Sure, there is. Um, but uh, uh, also, when you don't run, don't have to run, uh, probably uh, you care a little bit more. Uh, or also, there is a group of people, both Democrats and Republicans, that, 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 that care quite a lot about these things. Uh, I remember when I was a student again, uh, when I was a student, uh, uh, conservatives were the people who were very prudent with the funds. Uh, and they were steadfast against tax cuts and against deficits, budget deficits. Uh, still there are, now not many, but there are still some Republicans that there are. And there are still some uh, Democrats. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think, uh, I don't want to be that, uh, that pessimistic. Uh, I, I think that uh, reality prevails occasionally. Yes, sometimes something really bad has to happen before. Well, but uh, that is the thing is that uh, uh, I don't want to be a Cassandra for this seer of bad goods to come in the beginning, but I also see that there is the danger, there is that possibility. And that is what I said is that it's better to try to resolve those things before they, before they become that. Yes? Uh, in the 70s, uh, uh, high, high energy prices were sort of um, their rule of the day, and, and they impacted, impacted economic activity. Mm -hmm. Do you see that happening? Uh, not real. Uh, I don't know. By the way, uh, I, we have seen the oil there that uh, I moved quickly uh, for a fraction of a second, I think. Uh, that oil price, uh, it, uh, it went up to $56 and subsided down and came down to the low 40s and all that. Uh, you know, probably it's going to be in the 40s. It's going to remain in the 40s and all that. Uh, I personally do not think that uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that uh, we have more uh, influence the one way or the other uh, in oil producing areas now uh, directly and probably we uh, might do that. Uh, but also the, there is more conservation, more efforts about those things uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, probably, uh, and also efforts to find new, uh, new methods. Uh,
<coughs> for energy. Uh, there is that. Uh, but that issue, that is, by the way, uh, that is the negative supply side effects. Uh, notice what I talk most of the time as I started by the, the four components of aggregate spending, uh, and we examined quite a lot, interrogated, so to speak, uh, aggregate demand. And then, uh, then I started really talking about supply side, when I talk about labor growth and productivity growth and supply side. And of course, those are the pleasant, those are pleasant supply side shocks, improvement in productivity, and so that increases supply and uh, then you can have, instead of rising prices, you have lower prices. And uh, on top of that, you have higher output, national output. Uh, it natural, is natural resources have been under some upward price pressure recently, not just, not just oil. Yes, there are the, those resources that cannot uh, be uh, replenished. Uh, that, uh, <laughs> they are bound to increase and all that. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, I believe that uh, our resources are also, you know, our own country and the future of our country and to take care of it. <laughs> I'm one of those people who, who try to, uh, to replenish them, if possible, and all that. Uh, they are especially the exhaustible resources. The ones that you can uh, replenish costlessly or very little cost, uh, that's okay. Uh, but the ones that are gone forever, and that means also the environment and the air we pollute or clear, uh, the, uh, the streams we have, uh, all, all those are part of our national wealth. Uh, uh, it's unfortunate that we have not in this country uh, followed uh, the leads of uh, quite a few economists. Uh, one of my favorite was the late James Tobin, the Nobel Prize winner, uh, who designed uh, some, some way of measuring the, uh, the deterioration of wealth so that when you talk about national wealth is that it subtracts the damage you have done while producing all these nice things and what damage you have done and do that. Uh, in other, other countries I think started with that and they show in their national accounts that thing. Uh, I am also optimistic that eventually we're going to do that in a more uh, reasonable fashion than that. Yes. So you said that the, the hard landing scenario was, was somewhat remote. So what do you think is the, is the more likely scenario of soft landing? And if so, what, how would you describe that? Uh, well, uh, it could be a rocky one. Uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not going to be as bad you're going to crash. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can puncture a little bit your uh, ribs or whatever it is. If we do not take some measures, could be gradual, but would be methodical uh, to cure some of these problems. Uh, as I said, the longer they stay, uh, the more pressing they become, and then the damage is going to be. And then I can change my mind. And instead of saying that it is uh, low but not negligible, I would say it's rather high. But it's not high. I don't, I don't see it. Uh, I don't see. So you think it's basically going to be like a slow, orderly decline in the dollar and a... a, uh, a uh, no, hold? no, I could be worse. The dollar is going to be worse. That's why, uh, that is the one thing that I mentioned that I, I have been care, you know, I've been concerned quite a lot. I personally have been concerned. Uh, some people say maybe you worry too much about... Uh, no, uh, there is a danger. There is a danger. Uh, and it's not because it's coming out of the blue, but there are also reasons. There is the other deficit. It's twin. It's not an identical twin, but it's fraternal twin. Uh, it, uh, uh, it, it causes the problem. It causes the problem. And uh, then the issue, as I said, if, if one of those major central banks starts having second doubts, uh, then you would see that the interest rate, instead of being, uh, what was it, the 4 and 4.18 percent as well this morning, that the 10 year bond is going to be, then it could be say, 6. And that is a, a drastic movement very quickly. And that could have a major, major problem. It could happen. That, that is why I do not dismiss it. Yes? you think the yuan will remain tight to the dollar? Pardon? No, actually, uh, I saw uh, yesterday uh, a report that you mentioned a little bit earlier. I saw a report uh, that uh, they, they are going to repair they, uh, you know, that, that's the report that they're going to repair the yuan by five to seven percent up. 
but instead of pegging it to the dollar alone, it's going to be a, a broader basket of goods that are going to introduce, I think, the yen, the yen uh, and the one, the, the Korean one, uh, and, uh, and I think one more. So they are going to do that. And who knows, they may peg it to the, uh, or part, part of it could be the euro. So uh, then, yeah, that there was. Uh, and they say, I personally do not expect China to move very swiftly into have uh, flexible exchange rate. Uh, but I also think that they're going to do it, but very gradually. And that is encouraging thing that, uh, as a first step, that uh, they repack it and, and they revalue it, and say 6%. If they 6%, uh, uh, and that is going to be, uh, and then eventually they may do something else. And they could do the same thing uh, that they did with the liberalization of other things, that they did it very gradually before. Uh, in fact, uh, the, they pride themselves of being very gradual uh, because of all the Asian countries, they were the ones that were not hit uh, by currency uh, problems, uh, unlike Thailand and Indonesia and the Philippines and the other countries, uh, and Korea, uh, that, that, that had uh, the, the, the problems that. And it was because uh, they were very uh, slow in moving that. Uh, of course, also, that could cause problems, as I said, because it hides. Uh, the more you bottle in something, the more uh, danger there is for it to explode and cause the major harm. Yes? So either taxes go up or the um, exchange where or, or we just or we watch interest rates go up with, green, with Greenspan tightening up money um, or Asia stops buying our bonds and all these pictures, money gets pulled out of the economy. It seems like an, a recession is inevitable. Um, in order, in order to slow things down and, and get things back in balance, do you do you see that happening? And uh, no, so, actually, actually you see, I'm rather uh, uh, more optimistic than that because I said uh, what I said, and I said at least twice, uh, is that uh, uh, if we try to remedy the situation now that the economy is relatively in relatively good health, then we avoid that. Uh, we're going to have a slowdown. Obviously, you're going to have a slowdown. Um, but it's not going to be a recession, and it's not going to be a deep recession, and it's not going to be a prolonged recession. Uh, and there is a big difference between recession. <laughs> so uh, th 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 there is no doubt. If you increase taxes, uh, there, is going to be, uh, there is going to be a slowdown. On the other hand, if monetary policy uh, is in a position to do what it did during the Clinton years, uh, you can avoid. Remember, we had the uh, tax increases there. But Mr. Crispin agreed to have expansionary monetary policy. So he kept the interest rate down. Otherwise, they would have gone up. Uh, so that was Crispin's side of the bargain uh, when he uh, more or less demanded from Clinton and Rubin to, uh, to increase taxes and reduce the deficit. So it, it can be done. And as I said, you can avoid. You can avoid problems, as I said, is when you, you don't have to. You do it when you don't have to. When the bank is not against the war. Yes. Uh, what would you say is the root cause of the low savings rate of Americans? Uh, well, it's beyond my pay scale. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> actually, uh, you know, uh, 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 there is a lot of work. There is a lot of work about the microeconomics of. Uh, of, of this, uh, of decision making, uh, you know, so in, uh, in an interpolar sort of way, uh, whether you consume today or you consume tomorrow, uh, which means you don't consume it today, so that uh, you have to consume tomorrow something more. Uh, and and there are, that has to do with the the way people see the uh, economists call it time preference. Actually, you guys understand it's a discount. How you discount the future? <laughs> if you discount heavily the future you are not going to uh, save more. Uh, if you discount it, then uh, you are going to. So, uh, uh, so, uh, so that one way could be that. The other way, of course, that there are incentives. Uh, and uh, I'm not a specialist in that, but I would imagine there should be public finance people uh, that uh, could design uh, a, a set of incentives that could help the same way. Uh, which admittedly is uh, you know, it is shocking. You know, uh, we saw there, you know, <laughs> you know what we have. It, it, uh, it, it is shocking low. 
Uh, and uh, I don't think that is because our Americans are profligate and they're going to consume, they want to consume. It's a variety of reasons, you know. That, uh, and uh, better identify those reasons and try to have incentives to do that. Uh, there were the IRAs some time ago uh, and ways that would permit that. Uh, they had some effect, that, but mostly they took funds up from one account to another account. <laughs> and they didn't, uh, didn't have that much of an effect. I saw some hand. Uh, the name of the economist who was working in the environmental... Uh, no, he was not. Actually, he was a great economist, or one of the greatest macroeconomists, and the father of portfolio theory and monetary economics as well, and he was a member of the Council of Economic Advisors under Kennedy. His name uh, is James Tobin. He died two years ago. Uh, and uh, James Tobin, T-O-B-I-N. Uh, and he was uh, a professor of Yale all his life. Uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, he uh, cared late in his life uh, was uh, to modify the way we gathered the data for the national income and product accounts so that we would show the deterioration of the environment. Uh, that, so that when you say we have so much, it was seven uh, uh, trillion uh, GDP, uh, yeah, but is it net or is it net of the damage to the environment or the, uh, the uh, the cost that it would take us to, uh, to undo the damage, just the damage we did while producing those seven trillion, for example. And so that is the idea. And I think he had a blueprint. He had a blueprint uh, about that. Uh, most of his work, in fact, everything he did uh, turned out to be a whole field in economics. Uh, he got the Nobel Prize in 1987, but he could have easily gotten it for three, three different Nobel Prizes. So uh, that, that he was, uh, um, if I'm so, uh, if I say so many things about him is that uh, although he was not my teacher, I was not all in his university, but I, he, I consider him my mentor. Uh, and, uh, he called me my, uh, his, he told me, uh, he, he said that uh, I was his protege. <laughs> 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 Great, thank you very much. Thank you.